everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are so delighted to be offering this virtual week leading up to TESS and have an opportunity for everyone uh, to join us. Um, so as questions arise, please do drop them in the Q&A box um, and we'll be answering them at the end of the webinar. Uh, today's webinar will be 60 minutes, um, 45 minutes for the presentation and 10 minutes for a question and answer session um, later on. So please do introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from. Um, today's webinar will be recorded, so we'll be able to post it on eCampus Ontario's YouTube channel where you'll be able to view it in case you missed it. Um, and uh, live translation is available um, in French. Just click on the globe at the bottom of your screen to access that. So I would like to begin by honoring and acknowledging that the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and now is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I recognize and am grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the First People of this land. In this virtual space, we are all convening from different places, and this is what makes the online environment so special. I invite you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. So um, welcome to eCampuses Ontario's virtual test week. My name is Lofia Dalla, and I'm part of the communications team at eCampus Ontario, where I work primarily on events. Um, the Technology and Education Seminar and Showcase has been eCampuses Ontario's flagship event since 2015. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, TESS brings together the community to share, learn, and celebrate as we shape the future of learning together. This year's theme, the hybrid experience, uh, designing the future of learning, explores the evolution of an integrated digital and in-person education environment, the future of delivering vibrant learning experiences, and the steps we take together for a more effective and sustainable tomorrow. This year, we have three different tracks, imagining digital futures, digital inclusion, and practices and pedagogies. Today's webinar is about designing an equitable future of learning with activist multimedia, and it gives me great pleasure to be moderating today. I'll introduce our main presenters. We have Rebecca Sweetman, Associate Director of Educational Technologies, um, Arts and Science Online, Faculty of Arts and Science, Queen's University, as well as Yasmin uh, Durbal, uh, Educational Developer for Anti-Racism and Inclusion Center for Teaching and Learning at Queen's University. Um, so I'll hand it over to you and take it away. Thanks and welcome everybody. I see some messages in the Q&A that the chat is disabled. So I'll get our amazing eCampus host to get on that so that people can post things in the chat. Thanks. Um, we're very excited to talk to you today about activist design in educational multimedia. Um, and I think we're going to start with our own version of a, of a land acknowledgement. Yes, Lee? Thanks. So stories direct, inspire, and affirm ancient code of ethics. This is Manuelani Meyer, as cited by Leanne Simpson in Land as Pedagogy, Nishnabeg Intelligence and, Trans and Rebellious Transformation, an article from 2014. So what story will I tell of this land as we come together from our various locations occupying the unceded and stolen lands of indigenous peoples here on Turtle Island and around the world? I wanna draw your attention to the land where you are and your relationship to that land. What is that relationship? Would you say that you have one? Do you possess it? Is it yours? Do you rent it from someone else? And if so, who? Could or would you ever give it back? Is it a new relationship? Are you just getting to know each other? Are you intimately connected? Are you strangers? Are you friends? Do you listen to each other? Is that relationship intergenerational? Does it precede you and go beyond you? Is it limited to the here and now? 
Are you a steward for the future or a healer of the past? Do you help the land build new relationships or rebuild old ones? Do you know what the old ones were? I want to ask you, what are the stories you tell of this land? Where did you learn them? Will those stories be carried forward? What stories haven't you heard? And could you learn them? Would you share them? Leanne Simpson speaks about the land as pedagogy. The land is not only a teacher, but a way of learning. As we ask ourselves questions about our relationships with the land, about the stories we tell, we are also connected to reconciliation. In this same article as Manny Lani Myers quote, Samson writes, individual generated meaning is an authentic and grounded power. These meanings in all of their diversity then become the foundation of generated collective meanings and a plurality of truths. We make sense of land acknowledgements through our own stories, but I hope Oh, sorry, but our own stories make sense of the land for others as we tell them. I hope this reflection encourages us to carefully consider our stories and to seek out the ones that are missing about the land on which we stand so that we can generate new collective meanings about our relationships with the land and the indigenous peoples from whom it was taken. As a settler, I feel blessed and ashamed to live, learn, and play on these lands. And I hope that my stories and actions will help right the wrongs of past and present to honor the land and the peoples who have largely been erased from it. I stand with them and commit to doing the work to undo these harms and bring back life to them and their land. A land acknowledgement without action is futile. Our land acknowledgements are not enough to remedy our toxic hegemonic culture, to move us towards shared cultures of care, reciprocity, and pluriversal thriving. I steward a farm here on the unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabek, and Wendat peoples as part of the problematic Crawford purchases, and much like the lands occupied by Queen's University. In spring, long before our brave buds begin to blossom here on the farm, I hear the rustling awakening of the forest floor. And collectively, in spite of harsh winters, drought, climate change, and a few hundred years of settler neglect and destruction, these gifts from the land still rise up and give me the opportunity to witness, to be inspired, and to celebrate with gratitude. And also to multiply them in solidarity so that more emerge next year. Spring reminds me to care for the tender young shoots and their brilliant determination so that our harvests are abundant, so that we have resilience to support community, so that we have a new story to tell that is about building honor, justice, reciprocity, and sustainability. It is now fall, and I have to take stock of what I've tended to during the summer. I have to see whether my care produced a positive yield and considering, and, and I have to consider how I can strategically invest that yield back into the community and into the land to nourish and sustain us for another long winter. I have to see what care webs I can foster. I have to build collective care. This is transformational justice by design. And this radical interrelationship will build a future where we can mutually flourish to use Robin Wall Kimmerer's term, because all flourishing is mutual, she says. At Queen's as a multimedia professional, I am responsible for the stories that we tell and how we tell them. We are moving through the long winter of Canada's ongoing genocidal history and Queen's's ongoing colonial legacy and beginning again, informed by that trauma in a new season of change where we commit ourselves to undoing those past and ongoing harms and challenge ourselves to prevent new ones. In my multimedia work, I steward young shoots, our students, with compassion and solidarity. My mission is to nurture and inspire their growth. And to do this effectively, I must, I must first center reconciliation and justice at the heart of the student learning experience. In honoring and acknowledging the land, I make a commitment to decolonization, 
to truth, to equity, and to justice. And every piece of media I create for students, every image I choose, video I shoot or edit, every graphic I design, it is a tool to support and guide their future, to tell them true stories their colonial culture has deliberately suppressed, and to challenge them to become the future that we need. In our academic institutions, we are in the season of spring, awakening and rising up. Please join me and embrace an activist openness to learning to serve. It's time to design for change. So I'm Rebecca Sweetman, a cis hetero woman. I'm a product of global refugees and settler erasure largely. I'm a global mutt basically, and I can trace my roots back to Hong Kong, Ireland, England, Wales, Australia, Iran, Poland, and Russia at the border of Kazakhstan and Northern China. I was born in Toronto. I have lived in Indonesia, Brazil, and Hong Kong, and I now live in Prince Edward County. I'm a mother, a permaculture farmer, a documentary filmmaker, a grad student, and associate director of educational technologies at Queen's University. But most of all, I have spent my life trying to find the chink in the armor of our oppressive global paradigm and find means to actively design a way out of gendered racialized capitalism and patriarchy. In 2008, I founded a Canadian NGO to document and share grassroots solutions to global pressing issues in social and environmental justice. I did that to center the voices of the global South using activist educational documentary media as an anti-racist solidarity building project. In 2018, after a decade of fighting to demonstrate why such a project was even necessary, I closed the organization. It was called the Paradigm Shift Project and its work still lives on thanks to around 120 incredible organizations that I worked with around the world who continue to use those films to fight for their right to exist, to be change makers in an oppressive global paradigm that works so hard to snuff them out. Now at Queens, I find myself in a place where I can learn, help us learn how to practically walk all of that aspirational equity and decolonization talk that our institutions are so boldly publishing. I'll turn it over to my co-conspirator and coworker, Yasmin. Hello everyone, bonjour. Thank you, Rebecca, for this compelling introduction and for challenging us to rethink our relationship to this land and how we must connect colonialism, settler colonialism, and other interlocking systems of power and oppression, both here on Turtle Island and within larger global contexts. Attending to these connections between our collective struggles within oppressive global paradigms and building understanding and solidarities is the only way I would argue towards collective liberation. My name is Yasmin Jarbal and I am an educational developer in anti-racist pedagogies and inclusion at the Center for Teaching and Learning. I am joining you uh, today from Cataraqui or Kingston by its colonial name and from Queens University where I work, which both occupy the territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people, a territory that is governed by the Dish With One Spoon Treaty, a treaty that committed these nations to share the territory in peace, in friendship and respect with each nation maintaining its distinct sovereignty and where all newcomers are invited into this treaty and in the spirit of those obligations. Indigenous friends and colleagues of mine have taught me that land acknowledgements come from a long tradition practiced by some indigenous nations, but not all First Nations people as protocols and traditions vary. Where guests to a territory acknowledge their hosts and their lands and say where they themselves hail from. Within institutions such as the university, land acknowledgements come from the tireless work of Indigenous scholars and activists resisting invisibilization and erasure 
of colonial histories and colonial violence. I came to Canada as an international student from Algeria a little over 10 years ago, a country that has itself been grappling with the afterlifes of colonialism and neocolonialism. And at first I had a really hard time thinking of my relationship with settlement on this land, of myself as a settler. After all, I was the first generation in my family to be born in a quote unquote independent nation or a quote unquote post-colonial nation. Yet since coming here, I really had to contend with my own responsibilities and obligations to indigenous peoples on these lands who are still living under colonial rule and how I too am complicit with settler colonialism. Another thing I had to contend with was my relationship to settlement outside of the bounds of whiteness. How can I think of my commitment to live in solidarity, in friendship and respect on dish with one spoon territory, all the while fighting for indigenous sovereignty and indigenous self-determination? Rebecca and I chose to start this presentation by telling you pieces of our stories and histories because our positionalities, right, where we are each located in relationship to our various social identities, such as gender, race, class, ethnicity, and geographical location, shape how we understand and engage with the world, including our knowledges, our perspectives, and even our practices in our work and in our research. For researchers and for educators, these embodied experiences have an impact on what is taught, right, in terms of content, disciplinary canon, and epistemologies, as well as how it is taught, the methods, the practices, and activities we choose in our teaching. And finally, what and how knowledge is evaluated in the classroom and throughout the curriculum. Recognizing the responsibility, the responsibility of all those implicated in the design and implementing, oh, excuse me, implementation of curriculum and course design, including instructional designers and multimedia professionals, is central to the work that we do and the stories we tell. Indeed, what are those stories that we tell? As mentioned by Rebecca, every piece of media created for students, every image chosen, every video shot and edited, every graphic designed is an opportunity to support and guide a future, to tell students the true stories of colonial cultures and the ways that they have deliberately suppressed the histories of violence and, and colonialism and genocide. Educational media design is an opportunity to support and challenge students to become better global citizens, the global citizens we need towards the future that we want to create. And so we ask, how do we gain the skills to create activist media or quote unquote diversity by design? How do we recognize and challenge our own design assumptions and normative biases? Recognizing the responsibility of designing is therefore key. In recognizing the power and responsibility we have as storytellers in higher education, we need to carefully consider our stories and how we tell them. We must now consciously challenge the dominant narratives and worldviews we reproduce and reify to generate new collective meanings. We need to question our role as cultural reproducers. Are we reproducing the systemic biases of our exploitative worldview, or are we advancing a new paradigm of equity? I love this quote by Emery Willis, a scholar uh, who does a great deal of work on design philosophy. We design our world while our world acts back on us and designs us. Thinking about this quote as professionals who work in education, think about the transformative capacity of design. Think about who we are designing for now and how that prescribes who will receive our designs in the future. 
I often use this example with my teams at Arts and Science Online. It's not good enough to think about knowing who our students are right now, what their needs are, and how to serve them, how to design for them equitably. We need to think about who our students are not and why not, so that we can actively design now in the present for what we want and who we want our students to be in the future. This is a kind of ecosystems thinking of feedback loops. It requires not only great big perspective in design work, but it requires us to realize the tiny niche places where we can put a kink in the plans of our hostile global paradigm. This is not only anti-oppression work and transformative justice work, it is transformative design. So, to design an equitable future of learning, we need big, radical, systemic change. And we also need to find in each of our roles the small, overlooked opportunities to interject a new process that could radically change the future of learning. For me, one of these niches is in multimedia design of educational materials. And so, why do we want to create? training in activist multimedia. As practitioners, we recognize the centrality of indigenization, equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism, and accessibility, or IEDIAA, as it is framed within our university. And I know it's a longer acronym, but it's worth it. Because resisting the dilution of quote-unquote EDI work, um, we want to clearly articulate and name indigenization and anti-racism and accessibility as central tenets to our work, as central lenses through which we need to produce and review anti-oppressive, anti-colonial course materials. Our work speaks to Queen's University's mission to, quote, offer exceptional student experiences, cultivate excellence and leadership, and push the boundaries of knowledge through research in surface to an inclusive, diverse, and sustainable society, end quote. All the while challenging an educational system that continues to perpetuate global economies of knowledge that are oversaturated by hierarchies of race, of gender, of class, and ability. The future of learning needs to be equity informed, both to better serve diverse equity deserving students, but also to advance pedagogical practices and ultimately the content that is being taught. In the words of the Boyer 2030 Commission report, the equity excellence imperative, quote, equity and excellence are inextricably intertwined such that excellence without equity in terms of privilege, reproducing privilege is not true excellence. And equity in terms of mere access without excellence is an unfulfilled promise. And therefore we must think and rethink actively and challenge colonial logics and Western centric narratives, academic ableism and how the knowledges we teach we reproduce and reify are indeed marked by those power relations. However, expecting people to translate equity theory to technical practice is really a very abstract leap. We need to move beyond the ex existing teaching and learning theories and frameworks to build the technical skills required to produce activist media. So, when we think about multimedia designers, you know, oftentimes our job descriptions are, you know, our job titles even are just that very technical skill. You know, we're a photographer, we're a writer, we're a graphic designer, we're a video editor, we're, a, you know, it's, it's centered very much in those skills. And um, often, but not always, people come to those career paths through that very, very, um, technical training. People don't, you know, necessarily have a huge background and education in equity work broadly, broadly, 
broadly speaking, you know, and then decide, okay, now I'm going to be a graphic designer. You know, it's, it's really interesting to see how we have people in these technical professional roles, but how now we're also asking them to take on like, hey, while you're at it, could you also like decolonize the university? You know, like it, it's a big ask and it's not in our job descriptions generally. Like we're lucky if there's like one tiny little line in there that's like, and you know, should have some sensitivity toward equity, diversity, inclusion. It's not like the focus of your job. So, you know, I think we maybe need to shift this a little bit. We need to, you know, look at the people who we have in these skills and all of that technical training and then start to build this capacity so that we can analyze our skill set in a new way and develop new technical skills to be able to execute all of the equity, diversity, inclusion, indigenous, blah, 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 all the long acronyms work, anti-racist, anti-oppressionist design work. Um, you know, but we also need to start systemically building this into our job descriptions so that people are actually remunerated for doing this work. All right, so this has led us to the creation of this training. Um, so to train people doing educational multimedia work, uh, to train them in activist design, which we're using in a very broad sense of the word activist, we've created this training. Um, it consists first of an open educational resource, uh, a virtual session, and then a group challenge. This is a pilot project that we're embarking on and we welcome participants from other organizations and institutions to join in, to offer feedback and to help us hone this training as a practical intervention in literally designing that equitable future of learning. The, the first part of the resource is the open educational resource. This is an asynchronous module that you can navigate through freely at your own pace. And it's also a guide that you can revisit as need be. And I saw in the chat, there was a reference to Sasha's incredible work on design justice. It's one of the frameworks that we'll get into in this, in this training. Uh, we've licensed it uh, with Creative Commons licensing, requiring attribution, non-commercial use and share alike. The idea is that we're starting to build a community of practice in educational multimedia design around this resource sharing it, replicating it, you know, iterating and building it up uh, as a resource that could be used broadly across the sector. Um, the goal of the training in terms of the content is designed to be skills building, uh, to see how technical multimedia production tasks can be infused with activist action, to evaluate our design choices, and to be aware of our own biases in our design work. Today, we are launching this OER. Today, it's the first day, woo, -hoo! confetti. Where's the confetti? Okay. <laughs> and we're asking you to help us build this community of practice uh, to potentially offer your time, your skills, and your expertise as a peer reviewer of this resource. Uh, so that we can revise it with some thoughtful insights from our community before the launch of the first cohort to do this training in January of 2023. All right, in the next few slides, I'm kind of going to take you through a bit of the scaffold of what, uh, what the training covers. We talk about pre-production, driving change together. And in this, you know, we'll go through kind of the classics of, you know, Mayer's principles for multimedia learning. But I'm also going to tell you, in my own humble opinion, what I think Mayer might have missed, equity. Uh, and then we'll get into, you know, universal design for learning frameworks and perhaps where they might also just fall a little bit short, the limitations of inclusive design frameworks. And then we'll start to talk about activist design, what it is, how it can be transformative justice. We'll start to ask questions about design narratives and being able to identify microaggressions in design work. Uh, we'll help you reflect on your lens, you know, being able to analyze your own positionality and intersectionality as well. Um, and from there, we'll move into creating your own activist design principles to guide your work 
as informed by networks of design solidarity and models that are happening around the world. I love the comments coming in the chat, it's amazing. <laughs> All right, from there we move on to storyboarding retraining our design eye. We'll go through ableism, patriarchy, heteronormativity, racism and Islamophobia, tokenism and cultural appropriation, capitalism, economic marginalization, and even subtle things like conscious versus unconscious color choices. I'm going to talk about this image a tiny bit. This was part of an art installation. If you were in Toronto, you might have been lucky enough to see it a few years ago. Um, it's by a uh, Sobe Art Prize winner, uh, she's Canadian, named Kapwani Kiwanga. If you haven't seen her work, I highly recommend it. It's amazing. She's done everything from um, one of her art installations was in flowers and recreating all of the flower arrangements that were at every country's um, independence uh, celebrations. Yeah, like she does phenomenal, phenomenal work. Uh, this installation here uh, was just talking about colors that we use in spaces and how those quite aggressively manage geographies uh, to manipulate us as human beings. So the first color here you see is Baker Miller pink. Sometimes it's called drunk tank pink and it's used to subdue ag aggression. So sometimes you'll see it in, in carceral spaces. Um, the color that you see behind that neon light, it's often used in places like public restrooms uh, to control IV drug usage. Uh, if you use this specific kind of neon lighting in spaces, it, it well, it's supposed to act as a deterrent for IV drug users because they can't see their veins the same way with a specific kind of neon light. These are kind of things that, you know, if you, this is not part of your demographic, you don't necessarily question. And at the same time, these are these um, passive aggressions, if you know, if we can frame it that way, that exist all around us that we don't necessarily question. All right, from here, we'll go into production, which is really about building relationships and consent. We'll talk about how you gain access in community. We'll talk about a perhaps better multimedia informed consent protocol. Maybe we can move away from the sign all your rights away forever and always consent forms. And there's a model for doing that and how the process could work. Um, we looked at trauma informed approaches. We'll look at different angles of empowerment and it, like technically how we can hone our craft to, to center these stories appropriately, including gendered lenses through which we might film uh, and specific interviewing techniques. From here, we'll go into post-production, which is about sharing respectfully and with reciprocity. So we'll talk about editing ethics and honoring what is gifted, uh, which is the story that you received. We'll talk about community-based editing and uh, how that works. I'll give you an example from my work in Brazil, working with a, a, a large number of community-based organizers. Uh, to get all of their feedback and sign off and approval on every uh, everything I shot and edited. We'll talk about crowd sourced subtitling and how that can work, especially if you're working in other languages. Um, copyright licensing and the traditional knowledge labels, which if you haven't seen traditional knowledge labels, I highly recommend definitely check that part out. Um, and we'll go through some practical strategies for digital asset management as well. And after that, we'll go into the afterlife, which is really about honoring consent. So once you have distributed your work, you know, how do you maintain relationships? How do you um, edit in a responsive way to emergent needs? How do you do adaptations in a way that is ethical and that, you know, is constantly recentering the consent process? And how do you audit for allyship? This might even you know, be in terms of reviewing materials that uh, you didn't create. Okay, so from this, what can we learn from all of these examples? Essentially the toolkit, that open access resource, um, we go through how we need a code of design ethics to guide our work, how we need to build a community of practice around this work, 
and that there's ongoing research. There's tons of amazing work being done on this. This resource helps to pull some of these in. And I hope that for everybody here in the audience, you send me all the amazing other resources that we can include in this as well, um, because I know you've got some up your sleeve. All right, Yasmin. And so after this incredible and fulfilling um, module that would be asynchronous and that would last about three and a half hours, we will invite our participants um, to participate in a synchronous two hour session to debrief and share their learning and come together really in conversation with each other to ask the questions and unpack challenges that they may have faced going through um, this asynchronous self-learning training um, and build networks of solidarity and support. As we know, this work cannot be done can only be done relationally and in conversation with each other. And through a community of practice and collective care, we need this conversation to be done together. And following uh, this two hour uh, synchronous session, we will invite our participants to a challenge. And so we will invite them to put together a um, hand on project or experience. And through a six to eight week um, project, the participants will work together with members of the community of practice to design and produce a multimedia project uh, for example, here in the Kingston community or within different units at Queen's University with a client. And through this collaboration and work, they will be given access to key mentors to help guide their process and provide feedback along the way. And so the final aspect of this set challenge will be a presentation of the final product to the client or this collaborator where they will uh, receive additional feedback. And so we turn it to you. How can you, as our audience members, can help? We too seek to be accountable to our community and receive feedback, as mentioned by Rebecca, on how we can improve this model and how we can um, uh, enhance it and improve it. And so we would like to invite you to become a peer reviewer uh, to offer feedback on this resource. Uh, you can uh, email us at asomm at queensu.ca or use the QR code uh, at the top of the page. Spread the word with your colleagues uh, and in your institutions um, and stay tuned to be part our, uh, of our first cohort in January. And the two of us would like to thank you so much uh, for participating and we would like to open it up to uh, a conversation. Wow, thank you so much for that. The resource and virtual session, it all looks amazing. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat, um, well, in the Q&A. Um, so Alyssa Arnold is asking, what has been the biggest barrier with your equity work to date? Biggest barrier? Well, I would... Um... Generally, my answer usually goes veers toward the systemic. <laughs> so I would say that, you know, building this community of practice and um, thinking about our work as coalitions um, to take action on this is really important because the systems aren't necessarily designed right now uh, to be able to steward this kind of ethos and to facilitate this. And um, so the barriers, I would say right now, are kind of uh, colonial hangovers or like, you know, legacies in terms of the structures and processes that we have put in place within our various educational units here. Um, something simple as an example is the consent form, uh, you know, getting multimedia consent. And in my conversations uh, with lawyers about, about the form and whether it would hold up and everything else um, is, is about the fact that in trying to sh 
share reciprocity after the fact in, in being accountable to your participants and saying, yes, if your consent changes in the future, I will rework that footage to the best of my ability, knowing that, you know, there still might be copies out there or whatever, but I will do my part. I will pull stuff down. I will change it. I will act in an integrity as a designer into the future. The feedback I often get uh, from systemic barriers is, well, then you're committing resources into the future to do this. And yes, that, that is my intention. So this is what I mean about like finding those processes where you can uh, tweak it slightly. And then, you know, the intention for me is that that accountability um, outlives me and me as an individual in this particular role that I have affected systemic change by ensuring that I'm holding the university to account with that same degree of ethics and integrity. I, hope I would it. like to, to add to this, thank you, Rebecca, that I think that committing resources to transformative justice is incredibly important in our work. And I think to me, one of the biggest barriers that I have experienced or seen is that, you know, oftentimes we talk about being non-racist versus anti-racist and that you know there needs to be implication and, and activism and work um, that needs to be continuous in, 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 our, in our educational work, right? As educational developers, as faculty members, as instructional designers and uh, multimedia practitioners. Um, and if we cannot give, we cannot foster the change and actually, you know, create these tools to commit these resources for change, it will never happen. And so we were hoping in creating this module to start this conversation, to really foster the, the, the conversations with our participants and with our colleagues to, to create the change. Wow, yes, thank you for that. Um... What are some simple, small ways we can begin to introduce activist multimedia into our programs? Well, certainly, you know, I hope that you have a chance to review this module and can offer feedback on that, absolutely. Um, but I would say that those small ways often begin with, uh, you know, very critical self-awareness. So being able to analyze our own lens through which we are, you know, shooting videos, designing graphics, even choosing photographs in a course or the keyword searches that we use to, you know, navigate stock image banks. Um, you know, all of our own biases come through in those choices that we make. So a lot of the, the training resource is kind of dedicated to revealing how, um, how our biases infiltrate our, our design choices and processes. So I would say that, that critical lens, if you can work on your own critical lens, that will automatically shift everything that you're doing in your design. Yeah, for sure. And having like that presence and awareness, like during the process of designing for sure. Um, would a documentary count towards the group challenge multimedia Queens project? Yeah, absolutely. So the idea for the, the group challenge project is that um, it's an opportunity to do two things. One, to get like hands-on experience in, you know, pushing your activist multimedia skills um, technically. But it's also an opportunity to be able to build this community of practice. So my hope is that for people who take, you know, take the training and then have the virtual session that we're essentially building a cohort or, um, you know, a group of peers that will be able to support each other and challenge each other. Um, to, to be able to, to go further. So this would include practice in like you know, coming up with your design principles, you know, your ethical design principles together for the project. Um, and then you, you have peers there built into the project to help hold you to account. So that's, that's kind of um, where I'm hoping we can go with that um, group challenge, but certainly a documentary would be a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love how you've um, built in the community of practice and accountability and having, um, you know, other people there. We're all learning together. So I love um, how there's three different components. There's an OER and a virtual component as well as a challenge. In this OER, are there more examples of equitable design which educators can share with their learners? The photo of the pink and purple art design is a great talking point. Absolutely. The uh, module takes um, participants through a number of examples. Um, and there are a number of activities, for example, um, where uh, Rebecca has chosen some images from the stock image uh, that, that you can find it in your work and really encourages folks to question these images and think about why they might be problematic and how we might uh, push them further. Wow, I love that. Um, what signs, if any, do you see of equity work taking hold at your institution? Well, positions like this exist right now. Like if you think of Yasmin's title is, you know, in anti-racism. So, you know, there, there are some good signs. And I think really, um, you know, where I would like us to push further is to kind of figure out the operationalizing, you know, figure out how we can walk the talk. Um, because I think a lot, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed that institutions across the country seem to be saying a lot more publicly, you know, and that is great because that means that it gives us a way to say, you know, now this is part of my job. And, you know, now I am going to figure out a way to do that in my work. Um, and just, I'll just help make that happen for you. <laughs> So, yeah, I, th I think that's really reassuring. And I mean, we don't really, conversely, we don't have the option to do otherwise. So, you know, I, I don't think that our institutions need great praise for, you know, these bold statements at all. I think that is absolutely essential to all directions, you know, for a pluriversal future. And, you um, so at the same time, I think there's a lot of recognition that this is what needs to be happening. And it's a lot of the figuring out, you know, like we have to figure out how, how do we change these systemic um, issues or structures, um, hierarchies in our organizations uh, to be able to affect it. Mm -hmm. And this work has come, you know, on the backs of uh, racialized Black, Indigenous and faculty of color um, that have been, you know, fighting for, for this to happen, uh, both here at this institution and many others throughout the country. And so I think it's really, and that of the students as well, um, and staff who have been working and fighting for, for this work to happen. And so I, I want to highlight the fact that this is not just the institutions making it happen. It's all of these people who are carrying this work and labor um, and resources are needed um, and additional resources are needed. It's really wonderful that, you know, there are positions such as myself at the level of the university, but I want to see 10 more, like one in each faculty so that we can support even more people and do this work collaboratively. Yeah, for sure. Wouldn't that be amazing if each faculty had their own EDDI and yeah, could really break it down. Um, next, we're going to take a live question from Tony Thornton. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for letting me use uh, <clears throat> for doing it live. I'm eating tabbouleh at the same time. <laughs> it's lunch time. Um, I just want to say first, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I can't, I work with both Rebecca and Yasmin and can't speak highly enough of their work and I encourage everybody to do the training. I would be a peer reviewer and also take the training myself. So I'm really excited um, for those opportunities. I wanted to ask a question around <clears throat> just the, um, the activist paradigm and specifically around sort of like the emancipatory and liberatory kind of goals, not kind of, but the emancipatory and liberatory goals that we have, and I know that you share. 
I wondered if you could speak a little bit, and I get, I'm sort of asking this question from a very authentic place, and I, I know that you're able to answer it, so I'm not trying to sort of trip you up or like it's not an I gotcha moment or anything, but just the sense of like, you know, how is the framing that you have, um, you know, as something that's transformative and emancipatory for this project different from the kind of critical pedagogy that may, we might do sort of from an EDII or an I E B I I A lens. Um, so I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that. Thanks. Well, I think it's about, you know, helping to design and facilitate the skill set to design um, to be able to also center different voices and perspectives. So while I think from, you know, a critical pedagogy framework, you would be, you know, looking at kind of the structure of the course, the content in the course, the learning outcomes of the course and that kind of thing. Where I'm trying to push this is to actually be able to create the, the assets that will help to amplify that or, you know, to facilitate that really. So for example, you know, the example of a documentary film came up in a question, but I think being able to center uh, different expert voices, not necessarily from the mainstream Western canon, um, to center community-based voices, um, you know, all of that requires uh, skills in in how to receive those stories, how to uh, document, um, film, you know, technically produce those stories, and then also the ethical consideration of, of how you edit and narrate those stories. So really this kind of critical skill set is a, maybe a parallel or um, a, a mandatory parallel, <laughs> if, if I can say that, to be able to affect a similar goal. Does that answer your question, Tony? And, you know, if I may add to it, Rebecca, I think that to me, you know, the work that we do is not different from critical pedagogies or anti-racist pedagogies. They really are co-constitutive and supplementary to the work that we do. Um, and it's adding additional lenses and, like you say, skills and analytical skills that can be used in the work that we do. Um, and to me, the work, the way that this uh, module is framed pushes these, you know, activist goals, Tony, that, that you were underlining um, to be um, exercised both in the work environment, but also beyond it. And I really think that this is this additional uh, step and level that is going to be fostered uh, in the community of practice in seeing how we can um, work together towards these goals. Tony, did you thank have anything you. to add? No, I, I wasn't sure if you were waiting for me. Um, no, thank you so much. I appreciate the responses. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I recognize some people might have to drop off the call right at one o'clock, say you have another meeting and that I know we're all crazy overscheduled these days. <laughs> um, if you do have questions, if you pop them into the Q&A, I will take the time to answer all of them. Um, so if you if you don't get a chance to ask your question, please be sure to, to get it in there so that uh, Yasmin and I can, can give you an answer in there. I really am so thankful for you all um, and your you know, willingness to engage with this resource, to be able to offer your time as a peer reviewer and offer us uh, that critical feedback also. I'm um, so excited to co-create this with all of you. Oh, there's one other question that maybe I can pull up from the Q&A just before we go away, which is that um, I noticed that a lot of people, there are a couple of overlapping questions that talk about if you're not in necessarily a multimedia role, is this training still helpful for you? And I, I would say absolutely, like the degree to which you engage with it might depend on, you know, how much you're, you know, you're in, in the nitty gritty of the design. 
Um, but certainly all of the frameworks and the considerations are very helpful, even to be able to help direct a multimedia team, say you work with like an external consultant or a producer, um, you know, even to have this training as a framework to be able to ask critical questions of design work that is done for you in the service of educational multimedia. Um, I'd say it's immensely helpful. I know we've had some instructors interested in um, in using this framework as a tool to be able to review what is designed for their courses and uh, instructional designers, absolutely, it will be relevant. And I think quickly there is another question relating to this in terms of um, perhaps some obstacles in using this resource in other countries and restrictions in other countries or cultures. Um, you know, I, I would say that we created this module with the uh, Canadian context in mind, and there are definitely things that can be extrapolated um, and connected to in other cultures and contexts and political contexts. But obviously, you know, like that our, our, our framework is very much centered around uh, here, but there are information that can absolutely be parallel. And that being said, I would say that too, like a lot of the a lot of the content that I've written has been informed on my design practice in a lot of different countries. So actively working in, um, you know, Brazil, Peru, um, a lot of experience in Indonesia, um, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, India. Um, so whilst it, I would not dare venture, uh, you know, a globalized perspective there is no one globalized perspective but a lot of the time you know when you start working with a community-based framework you might find that actually it extends to a lot of other global cultures even better than our own so you know i hope we can help to steward that community and um build that up here amazing um and we have one more question do you think this awareness of using activist multimedia is not limited only to designers and developers, but also other stakeholders such as faculty policymakers to make the cultural change in the mindset? Yeah, so the cultural change is the big one and that's definitely what I'm going for. So um, I would encourage you to, you know, keep trying to find the chink in the armor, you know, like keep trying to find those strategic points for intervention. And you know, the more that we can work together and think about coalition building, think about community building around setting standards for you know the, this being an expectation for the educational multimedia we produce. Um, you know, the more the more I think we'll see that culture change. Mm -hmm. For sure, and it's all of us starting by taking action with where we're at right now, right? Um, so that concludes today's webinar. I would like to thank our presenters, Rebecca and Yasmin, for sharing their work and insights with us today. Um, thank you for our audience. I hope you enjoyed today's session and join our other webinars later in this week. Um, thank you to eCampus Ontario's behind the scenes, scenes team for making uh, this webinar possible. Um, and the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel. So if you want to share it with anyone who wasn't able to make it today, um, we have two more webinars uh, coming up this week. Um, and you can also join our TESS Slack channel. Uh, the links are being dropped in the chat right now for those. So you'll be able to yeah, join in there. Thank you so much, everyone. And for thank today. you, Lufia, for facilitating this conversation and Christian for interpreting for us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to have you both here today. So we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.